Welcome everybody to this next session. So it's a great uh, pleasure to have uh, Gregory share. Uh, he's a uh, leading expert in, I mean, diverse fields, starting from general stochastic processes, uh, extreme value, value statistics, uh, random metrics theory, and all related uh, topics. Uh, so today, I mean, like uh, this uh, week, uh, he's going to give a set of lectures on uh, Dyson, Brown, and Mosson, uh, fermions, uh, and random metrics theory. Yeah, please, Gregory. Yeah, please go. Okay, thank you very much, Sanjib, uh, for the introduction. Thank you very much uh, to both of you, Avishek and Sanjib, for uh, the organization of this uh, of this school. So, uh, and uh, good afternoon or good evening, uh, uh, good morning uh, to to all of you. So, during this uh, these lectures, indeed, I will try to cover. Um, I mean, I was asked somehow to co cover these three topics which are in the in the title, uh, Dyson's Brownian motion, fermions, and random metric theory. Um, in fact, indeed, uh, the, the, common, uh, the common tools uh, behind uh, all these topics that I will uh, touch upon uh, are indeed the random metric theory. And therefore, I started to, uh, I decided to start with a short uh, crash course, if you want, or introduction to random metric theory, at least. Um, on the, the basic uh, features and tools uh, that we will need in the following. I thought uh, that it was probably not, uh, that, that, that maybe not all of you are familiar with that. So I will start with that. And I guess that it will probably, I will probably need say two lectures to do that. I mean, I will see, I will see how, how it goes, but, and that will give you, that it will give us say uh, a good background, I think to start with. Um, and then uh, the second subject uh, that I will uh, uh, start, I mean, or that I will talk about uh, are around uh, fermions, uh, which is a topic that uh, we have been working quite a lot uh, uh, during these last years uh, with uh, my colleagues and friends, Satya is here, um, and also uh, other colleagues, uh, Pierre Le Doussal, David Dean, and uh, many other students. Uh, but I will try, of course, to, to stay quite uh, elementary, and uh, I will try to show you uh, that uh, fermions actually are very nice uh, uh, applications and that, that, that they have very natural connections to random matrix theory. And that also sheds light somehow uh, on, on how to understand uh, random matrix theory from a more physical point of view, maybe. So that will be, I, th I guess, I mean, lecture three and four. Um, we will see how it goes, but that, that's what I have in mind. And then uh, I will end up with maybe what is uh, technically also the thing which is, I think, a, a bit more involved, uh, which has to do with a non-intersecting path. And that will naturally uh, lead us uh, to the connections uh, with random matrix theory, and in particular, uh, with Dyson's Brownian motion. Okay, so that's somehow, uh, I mean, uh, if you look a bit at the title, uh, instead of going in that direction, uh, essentially, uh, I decided to go uh, the other way around uh, because I think that it was conceptually more natural to do this way. Right. So let's uh, let's start and um, let's start with uh, these uh, first uh, lectures. Probably uh, two of them, as I as I said. Uh, so that's the 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 outline of 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 this these two first lectures on the. Uh, random matrix theory, uh, which is uh, usually uh, called RMT. And I will start with a general overview and uh, show you some applications uh, briefly on RMT. I will not enter into the details, but just to set up a little bit uh, uh, to tell you where it comes from, uh, where what are the main questions uh, in this uh, in this in this topic, and um, and then I will I will be a bit more precise and discuss. Uh, some uh, ensembles of RMT. I uh, will basically uh, uh, show you uh, first some Wigner ensembles, and then I will discuss the uh, uh, rotationally invariant ensembles going to the Gaussian orthogonal and unitary ensembles in particular. And uh, that will bring me uh, to this uh, Coulomb gas approach, uh, which was devised by Dyson in the 60s. Um, and to show you really how this problem of uh, random matrix theory, which uh, initially, I mean, at least uh, to some extent, is a purely mathematical problem, uh, can be uh, understood in terms in a very physical term, physical terms. I mean, in a, 
relatively uh, simple way uh, using uh, this mapping to a Coulomb gas and then use the standard tools of a um, statistical physics. And then uh, I will, uh, and so I think I think that I, I hope I will have time to cover this this three these three uh, these three steps today, uh, and then uh, I will spend quite some time on what I call local statistics, um, where uh, I will try to discuss the, this these two very important notions, uh, which are the the bulk and the edge, and in particular uh, looking at the edge, that means that looking at what happens at the border at the edge of the uh, of the uh, support of uh, the density uh, of the eigenvalues that means if you look at the largest eigenvalues uh, i would like to discuss the tracy rhythm fluctuations and its various applications uh, which have been quite which became very popular during now the last 15 to 20 years so that's the that's the program and uh, let's uh, let's start uh, with uh, a brief introduction So basically, the, the, the topic uh, of uh, random entry series is, is quite simple to, to explain. Uh, I will just consider uh, capital M, which is a uh, N cross N uh, matrix. And it's random in the sense that the entries are random. OK, and I will generically denote them MGK. And know that uh, these guys, uh, in principle, that can be real or complex. And then there are various questions uh, that uh, that you may uh, that uh, you you may ask about uh, about these uh, these random matrices. Um, typically, uh, you would like to say something, and that's what random matrix really is about: is about the statistics of uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So that's really the, the main goal of uh, random matrix theory. And in particular, in many cases, in fact, in most of the cases, we will be interested in the limit when n goes to infinity, because we will see that, uh, I mean, from a concrete applications, I mean, usually uh, when the interesting uh, uh, applications uh, really imply large matrices, as we will see. And that's also uh, in the in that limit that uh, nice uh, collective and nice uh, uh, effects uh, will emerge. So that's really uh, what we are after. Now, uh, this problem, uh, as you probably already know, uh, has many uh, applications. But in fact, uh, in physics, uh, it was introduced uh, by Wigner. in the 50s and as you probably know uh, what he was uh, interested in is uh, in the context of uh, nuclear physics uh, where you are interested in understanding uh, the, the spectra and that means trying to solve the Schrodinger equation if you want uh, for uh, big nuclei, and uh, he introduced this approach uh, to essentially model uh, the uh, the energy levels of big nuclei. And the idea was that uh, you have, uh, if you want really to solve the Schrodinger equation for such a nuclei, I mean, of course, you can imagine that it will be very involved. I mean, you will have complex interactions between the nuclei, the nucleons. And therefore, he proposed to say, OK, let's forget about this kind of uh, microscopic uh, detailed approach. And let's try to see what happens if um, uh, we say that, OK, the system is so complex that it's probably a good approximation to treat it as a random, a random system. And if it's random, then the spectrum uh, of the Hamiltonian will be itself uh, random. And then uh, it turns out that this approach was extremely successful. And after that, uh, this uh, kind of approach, that means uh, studying uh, 
random matrices to various physical systems uh, became extremely popular. And uh, since then, there has been a lot of applications. Okay, so that's uh, that's what is really. Uh, oops, sorry. So that's really what uh, what I want to. Uh, oop. <laughs> So there are uh, many books, uh, and there is, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the Oxford Handbook of Random Matrices. I, I, I can I can leave you some some references uh, later on. Uh, one 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 kind of uh, one set of, of examples. I just want to to give some of them where random matrices uh, arises na naturally. Uh, one is uh, in the context of mesoscopic physics. Uh, so basically what you, what I have in mind is that uh, you can have say a, a quantum cavity which might uh, be more or less regular and uh, you have to uh, imagine that you have some uh, electromagnetic uh, waves uh, that are sort of arriving there. Uh, so let me just denote it. Uh, so suppose that you have some kind of plane waves. Okay, eyes. And then uh, essentially uh, when they enter this uh, quantum cavity, uh, they will experience uh, quantum scattering. And then uh, at the other side here, uh, you will have some outcoming waves, K, K prime I. And a quite natural way of characterizing this quantum scattering um, phenomenon is just to say that uh, there is a matrix relation uh, between this vector K prime uh, in terms of the incidental uh, wave, wave vector K, and basically they are connected by the scattering matrix. And if this uh, quantum cavity here uh, is sufficiently uh, irregular, uh, which is quite often the case, uh, then basically that will be a good approximation to say that this S here is a random matrix. Okay, so that's a quite a quite natural a quite natural example uh, that you might uh, think of. Um, another example that I will just uh, touch upon. Uh, is the case of random graph. Okay, so typically a graph would be characterized by some adjacency uh, matrix with which characterizes basically the topology of the uh, of of your network or your graph. And again, uh, if uh, this uh, graph is random, then this adjacency matrix uh, will also be uh, random. Okay, so these are rather natural examples where you see that random matrices occur. There are also other typical examples of, uh, uh, for instance, a localization problem in quantum mechanics where basically uh, the notion of a random matrix uh, appears, appears quite naturally. Now, rather remarkably, uh, it turns out that random matrix ideas uh, have also emerged in a variety of contexts where uh, there is no obvious random matrix behind, uh, be, be behind the problem. So uh, I will just mention a few that I will, of course, not have time to treat in details, but um, for instance, uh, random matrix theory uh, has uh, popped up uh, in number theory. And there are, in fact, very nice connection between random matrix theory and the Riemann zeta function. Oops, sorry. So that's a place where you don't see immediately some uh, RMT or random matrix model, but it turns out uh, that, uh, that there are, and there are very deep connections. Another example where uh, it's not completely obvious that random matrix theory can play a role uh, is in the realm of combinatorics. For instance, uh, if you look at some interesting observables 
in the context of random permutations, such that the longest increasing subsequence in such permutations, then people have shown during the last 10, 15 years that random matrix theory was also there. And in fact, uh, so these are relatively mathematical pre problems, um, but one uh, instance of uh, RMT, uh, which in the context of physics, uh, which is, I think, uh, particularly interesting, and I hope I will have time to, to say a word about this, uh, is uh, in the context of uh, uh, fluctuating stochastic, I'll say, uh, fluctuating interfaces. And that's in particular uh, what is called today the, the universality class of the cardar parisi zang equation. So I will be more precise in the, in the future lecture, in the next lectures, I guess. But as you probably know, random matrix theory have played a very important role here uh, in this context. And related to that uh, is also the problem, which I probably I will not have time to uh, to, 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 talk, to talk, talk about, but uh, as you probably know, this is related to uh, directed polymers uh, plus disorder, so in a disordered environment. So that means that uh, this, uh, I mean, these techniques of RMT uh, actually have played a crucial role, a very important role during the last years. Uh, and I hope that I can give you uh, the flavor of these of these applications um, in uh, in of random matrix theory in physics. So in fact, uh, although it's true that usually, I mean, uh, in physicists, where usually we, we we like to think that uh, RMT was was sort of invented by 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 the physicists. In fact, this is not this is not totally true. And uh, it turns out that uh, RMT uh, actually showed up before Wigner's work. Uh, in the context of statistics. And in fact, uh, it was introduced by uh, a guy called John Wishart. Maybe uh, you might have heard his name because he left uh, his name to one important ensemble of RMT. Um, and he was actually uh, more interested in, uh, so this was actually much, much before because it was, it was actually in, uh, at the end of the 20s, I think it was, uh, um, 1928. And basically what, what he was interested in uh, was interested in correlations in time series. So basically, I mean, what, 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 what you can have in mind is that um, you just suppose that uh, you have, say, a vector. Uh, let me denote it as x of t. And it has, uh, say, uh, n components. So you look at what happens uh, at a given time t. So you will have x. Two. So you have a set of data. So typically, this x i of t, they might be uh, the price of stock i uh, at time t. Uh, so you might think of x of t as a kind of portfolio. Um, you can also think of x i of t uh, being uh, the uh, say the, the temperature uh, at the city I on the day T, for instance, okay? So that can be the stock price. And that can be a daily temperature. And uh, what you uh, are interested in, uh, at least what statisticians are usually uh, interested in is, is in the correlation matrix. Uh, say this CJK, uh, which is defined by the so these are the empirical correlations. So you just uh, look at this. GT, it's KT, and then you just average over T. So, uh, so you have uh, a correlation, you have naturally a matrix, okay, which characterizes the, the correlations between the different entries that you have here. Yeah, sorry, this should be an X, I'm sorry. It should be small X. And this object, uh, as you see, is, is naturally uh, is, is 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 a random correlation matrix. Yeah. And you would like to know 
uh, I mean, how does this matrix look like? So it's, it's random in the sense that it's excise. I mean, you will take, take them if you want to make a model as random variables. And typically the study of these kind of objects of random matrices play a crucial role in what is called principal component analysis. Um, and this actually has a huge amount of, of applications, uh, which I will not at all discuss, but uh, it has actually many applications uh, in the data analysis. Uh, okay, in particular in financial data analysis, but, but not only. So that's just to show you that uh, random matrices indeed, I mean, uh, has a very wide uh, spectrum of applications, uh, ranging from nuclear physics to number theory, uh, graph theory, uh, disordered, uh, disordered problem, and disordered systems. And um, okay, so uh, I hope that uh, I will have time to uh, give you a little bit of more insight of uh, uh, the, the, the methods that we have uh, to, to study this, uh, this problem. Okay. Good. So let's, uh, go to the, the second point of, of, of this, uh, of this, uh, of this lecture, uh, which has to do with the, uh, ensembles of RMT. So I will not be exhaustive because there were actually a very large list of, of, uh, of RMT models and RMT ensembles, but I would like to discuss with you two main ensembles, which are first uh, the Wigner matrices and the second one, uh, the rotationally invariant ensembles, which to some extent uh, are actually the most natural ones. Okay, so I will restrict myself somehow uh, by following uh, Wigner, uh, and I will essentially uh, discuss here the case where the case of matrices uh, which have a real spectrum. So again, for Wigner, this was quite natural because uh, he was considering uh, eigenvalues of uh, uh, Hermitian operators, which are of course uh, uh, real. And that means that uh, I will stick to this, uh, to this idea. And to be more concrete, in fact, uh, I will even look at the case where uh, either the matrix, the matrix is say uh, real symmetric, or uh, complex and Hermitian. Okay, because, okay, in, in these cases, of course, we know that the eigenvalues uh, uh, will be real, even though they are random. Uh, with probability one, uh, all the, 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 the eigenvalues will be, will, will, be, will be real, will be real, sorry. So what I said, I mean, I think, it, I mean, having this in mind, so if you focus on this, uh, I mean, if you stick to, this, to, to, this, to these ensembles, uh, it's fair to say that you have basically two main categories uh, of random matrices, I should say. So the first, uh, first uh, ensemble that uh, I would like to discuss and which are maybe the most natural one that you can think of, uh, which are simply uh, ensembles uh, with independent entries. independent, but respecting of course the symmetry, right? That they, they are real or, um, sorry, that they are symmetric or uh, emission. Uh, and that's basically the, what is called, what is called, the, this is what we usually call Wigner matrices. Because that's actually the matrices that Wigner introduces himself. So what do we have in mind here? Well, uh, what I have in mind is, is I mean, in this case, the, the thing is relatively simple is that, so you have your matrix elements, 
MGK. So again, they might be uh, uh, complex or real. And I will just denote by X and Y the real Okay, so XI and JK are both real, of course. And this whole thing together. Okay, so yeah, I mean, I heard something, so. So by definition, of course, X and Ys are just, uh, are just uh, uh, random and real, okay? And now I want to, to, to write the, uh, the, the, the joint PDF of these X i's and Y i's. Okay, so I want to look at the joint probability. Density function uh, of a given realization of P of M. Okay, so that means that I want to really look at, it's like defining if you want a, a probability measure, a probability distribution on the ensembles of, of matrices, okay? So I really want to, to write something like that. So of course, uh, I need to, 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 uh, to remember uh, something which is that my matrix M, um, it, is, it has to be a real, uh, sorry, it, it has to be real symmetric or complex emission. So that means that essentially uh, you will fix, for, so you will, you, you will take randomly all the elements that are in this upper triangle, including the diagonal, and then the rest, so the, the, uh, the upper, uh, the upper triangle here is just fixed by symmetry. Okay. So, uh, in other words, I mean, if I want really to be uh, to be uh, more explicit, uh, this P of M here will be of that form. So these are IID. Okay. So I will fix. So that means that they are, uh, well, they are independent, sorry. They are not necessarily uh, identical, but they are independent. And basically, so let me just define first the, so this is for the diagonal elements, okay? So the one, sorry, that are on the diagonal. And then I need to fix the guys which are uh, in this upper triangle here. So I will just have a product. or j less than k. And then uh, I will need to draw both uh, the yeah. real part and the imaginary Basically. part. So this is for real. And then you might have a similar one for the imaginary part. Okay, so that's uh, that's very. Uh, I mean, that's quite straightforward, uh, and that's that's that defines a Wigner uh, a Wigner matrices. Now, uh, maybe at, at this stage, it's already. I mean, if you have this picture in mind, I mean, it's 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 quite useful to think of uh, to think about the number of degrees of freedom that you have in this in these matrices, uh, because of course you see the uh, the the matrix has n square elements, but the number of independent degrees of freedom is not n square. And because it's just these upper uh, upper triangles elements, right? That are that are indeed um, that and these indeed independent. Whole thing and if you just count how many you have, so here you would have one guy, here you would have two guys, here you will have three guys, if you have four guys, etc. So you have just the sum. If you want, if if you want to count the number of degrees of freedom. And these. Well, it's quite easy to show, I mean, to compute, right? Is if you just look at uh, the picture that I have, you will have one plus two plus three plus n, and that's just n and minus one by two. I will come to that uh, later. But it's quite useful to have this in mind. 
Okay. So these are the Wigner Wigner matrices. Now, and in fact, uh, I will not say too much about. Uh, I mean, uh, in general, there, there is a whole literature on the on this on this on these Wigner matrices. But at the end, I will uh, focus on a very special uh, subclass. But the other useful ensemble is uh, what I would like to call a rotationally invariant ensemble. And the idea is relatively easy to understand. If you suppose that, so let's let's stick now to uh, to be more concrete. I will just stick to uh, real symmetric matrices, okay? Uh, instead of, I mean, I will just discard for the moment uh, the Hermitian complex Hermitian. So I suppose that M uh, is a real symmetric. Random matrices. And well, then you know that uh, there exists that that this matrix can be diagonalized, okay? And it can be just diagonalized by an orthogonal transformation. So that means that uh, there exists uh, a couple of say uh, two matrices, O and lambda, uh, where lambda is diagonal. Okay, so the lambda i's are just the eigenvalues of M. And O is uh, just uh, an orthogonal matrix. That means that O, o transpose equals to identity. And such that what? Uh, Well, such that uh, you can indeed write M as, uh, okay, so that O lambda O minus one or O transpose. Okay, so that's that's that, that that's the thing. Now, the idea is that uh, when you start to think about, about matrices and how to define a, an appropriate measure on your, on your, uh, on the set of matrices that you are considering, uh, it's quite relevant in many situations, and actually that was the case uh, considered, for instance, in nuclear physics. Um, it's quite natural to consider ensembles which are invariant under this kind of transformation. So in other words, uh, the idea is that um, of a rotationally invariant ensemble, is to say that if you look at P of M, so if I look at the sum matrix, then it should be the same as, so instead, uh, if I just do some similarity transformation on, on M, so that means that if I just uh, do this kind of transformation, uh, then basically uh, the, stati the, the statistical weight should be the same. So essentially it means that um, essentially, it means that uh, uh, the, the, the measure uh, will only uh, depend on the eigenvalues of your matrices, okay? And this is called, uh, these are called these uh, um, rotationally invariant ensembles. And what happens, as I said, is that uh, in such ensembles, uh, the eigenvectors actually uh, do not play an important role. Uh, will be a little bit more precise in a minute. But you see why, I mean, you see why, because as I told you, um, the, 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 the probability measure of a, of a matrix because of this, of this property, uh, okay, I'm not showing it here, but you can feel it, uh, should only depend on the set of eigenvalues. And so that means that the eigenvectors are a little bit spectators um, and the, the, the eigenvectors do not play a very important role. They are not uninteresting at all, but uh... okay. So I've seen one question. Uh, yeah, what I mean by symmetry uh, is relatively simple. So you see, uh, if I look at my matrix M, M is either, uh, suppose it's real. Okay, let's look at that, the real case. So that means uh, real symmetric. So that means that Mij 
has to be equal to mji okay for i different from j so in other words that means that once you have drawn these random numbers here then the the symmetric ones which are on the lower triangle are, are just fixed okay so and they are not independent and that they should be exactly the same and fixed by this relation. On the other hand, the uh, the purely diagonal ones, so MII are just, they are free to see whatever, I mean, to be to be whatever. Okay, Krishna, is, is it fine? Yeah. Okay, very good. So it turns out that which probability distribution is referred to fill the matrix element? Well, okay, well, this is fixed by that. So this is the answer number one. At the moment, they are whatever they want. I will be a bit more specific in a while. So for any matrix in the rotational invariant ensemble, the same for any similarity transformation. Yes, so that's what is written here. So now, uh, if I just, uh, there is uh, basically uh, a theorem uh, from uh, that that says that if you are looking at such rotationally invariant measure, then and this is uh, a theorem which is due to to Weil, uh, what you can show I mean it's it's quite intuitive uh, to understand why it's like that, but the p of m should be of that form. It should be of the form exponential of minus trace of some function of m. So it's clear that uh, at least one can easily understand that if p of m has this uh, property, since the trace of m or the trace of any uh, polynomials of m, trace of m squared, trace of m cube is independent, I mean, it does not depend uh, or is invariant if you want under such a transformation, then it's pretty clear that if exponential of, I mean, if the measure is of that type, then it is rotationally invariant. Okay, it's a bit, of course, more difficult to show the other way around, but uh, it turns out that uh, this is true. And in fact, uh, this is just equivalent. So we have shown these two kinds of ensembles, okay? Uh, ones are the Wigner ensembles, so Wigner, you really take uh, Wigner matrices, you take your matrix and you fill it uh, with uh, random numbers with the constraints that, uh, that you have to, uh, to, uh, to respect this symmetry, okay? And you have these other uh, uh, ensembles, um, uh, which, is rotationally, uh, which are rotationally invariant and which are, I mean, constructed with this prescription and which at the end uh, are of that form, okay? So I should say that here V of M is some, is some function. Uh, that you can choose priori uh, as you wish, and it will depend on the model uh, that, that, you, that you have to, to look at. Now, a natural question then comes uh, is whether, I mean, uh, are these two ensembles completely, uh, completely disjoint? Or is there some uh, intersection? And uh, what is, if, if it exists, uh, what is the intersection? So there is a very nice uh, and and simple uh, and simple uh, theorems, uh, which has which says that um, the only matrices that belong to the ensembles A, Wigner, or B, rotationally invariant, are the Gaussian uh, random matrices. Okay, so in a sense, uh, we see that the Gaussian uh, the Gaussian measure, as we know from standard probability theory. Uh, it also plays a role uh, in, uh, in, the, in this context of random matrices. Um, and in fact, uh, so that's something that I will just and which is from the 60s. Basically, uh, that says the following is that uh, the only ensembles that uh, belong, or the only matrices, if you want, that belong 
to A, that means Wigner, and B uh, are of a simple form, uh, are the Gaussian ensembles. Okay, so that means that uh, really P of M, so the only matrices uh, that are of the form that I mentioned, so they are Gaussian, so that means that you can just write it as exponential of trace M squared minus B trace M. And there is some normalization factor. So, you well, know, you see, it's clear that uh, they belong to the 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 the, the case B, right? Because uh, it's clear that uh, they are of that form. Trace is a linear operation, so V of M is just A M squared plus B M. Now, it's not completely evident that this kind of measure here defines a Wigner matrix, and that's I think instructive. Just since we haven't done yet any concrete computation, maybe it's good to uh, uh, to do one just to uh, to start with something. And I just want to show you that this is indeed a Wigner matrices, okay? That's, that this is of type A. That means Wigner. Okay, so let me just make a short stop be before doing that. I see that the lower triangular, okay, sorry. So uh, so for any matrix, not a single one. Yes, so Fabien Mathieu, can you please say again what we study in the context of rotationally invariant ones? Because the spectrum is then just a collection of random numbers given from scratch, no? Uh, well, uh, no, I mean, uh, they are not given from scratch uh, because for rotationally invariant ensemble, you see that uh, you have a strong constraint at the end is that the measure on the, the, the so here I've really defined uh, a probability not on the um, matrix elements, but on the matrix as a whole. And at the moment, uh, I mean, usually it's very hard uh, to come back I mean, to translate this into a probability measure for the elements. There is one case where you can do that, and this is the one that I want to show you now. This is the Gaussian case. But otherwise, you see that you really define, instead of defining a measure on the matrix elements, which is what Wigner is doing, here you really define a probability measure on the set of matrices, okay? I hope I, ans I answered your question. Okay. But it turns out that this is one case where precisely uh, we can do both. And let's, do the, let, let's see what, what, what it gives. So let's just try to uh, rewrite this, uh, this, this, exponential, this exponential weight here. So uh, let's do it. Okay, so this is just exponential of what? So let's just rewrite what this trace m square is. So by definition, this is just a sum of gk, m, gk, m, uh, m, gk, m, k, j. Okay, so that's the definition of a trace uh, of m squared. And then here I just have the sum, uh, say over j, MJJ. Okay, so here let me just uh, rewrite this and the first terms here uh, by separating in the first, uh, in this double sum here, I will separate the diagonal terms J equals to K and J different not equal to K. Okay, so that's what it gives. It's just the sum over J, MJJ squared. And then I get minus A, sum from J different from K of MGK times MKJ, but uh, MKJ, because the matrix 
is symmetric has to satisfy this property. Okay, so that means simply that here I will get a square. And then I have a simple term here, which is minus b sum over j mjj. Okay, so now if you just gather uh, all, all, all the terms, uh, what, you, what you easily see no, is that uh, this has almost the Wigner, the Wigner form. Okay, but if you go to the way, uh, if you go back to the way I define the Wigner measure and the way this is usually defined, is that here you see the, 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 the product is for j strictly less than k. And here, of course, I can use on top of that, uh, the property that the exponential of the sum is the product of the exponentials. And therefore, uh, you would simply get the following. So let's maybe first uh, uh, with the, uh... okay, so I will just get exponential of minus a, j, mg squared. So these are just the, the measure if you want on the diagonal terms. And now this, uh, this sum here, uh, I just rewrite it in a slightly different way, uh, which is minus two, two A sum for J strictly less than K of MG K squared. Okay, and indeed now uh, at the end of the day, you can still write it exactly as a Wigner matrix uh, should look like because that will be exponential of a minus mj. And then I will have indeed the product of i less than j exponential of minus 2i minus ij squared. And this is exactly of the Wigner form. Okay, so that's, uh, so that's really, uh, so that tells you that this matrix uh, is indeed, uh, so that, that means that uh, belongs to A. Now, certainly the, 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 and at this stage, uh, I just make this remark, which I think is important is that uh, basically for, for B equals zero, okay, so that's the most natural, um, I mean, well-studied uh, model that we will, uh, come back to in a minute. Uh, what you see is that the the diagonal terms and the uh, of diagonal terms uh, they are these are Gaussian random variables, but they are not exactly identical. In fact, uh, the variance of the diagonal terms, oops, sorry, uh, is just uh, is just twice uh, the variance of the of diagonal terms. Okay. So let's, let me just, uh, so that means that they fluctuate a little bit more. But this is quite important if you really want to have a, a real symmetric matrix. Okay, so we have seen this, uh, these two ensembles, uh, these two sets of ensembles, we have seen that they have a nice inter intersection. And in fact, as you can guess, uh, this intersection is probably, uh, defines probably the, the most interesting uh, ensembles. And uh, that's the one that, uh, that we will study uh, in the following. So basically uh, in the following, That means today, but also in the in the, in, in, in in the forthcoming days, um, I will set b equal zero, and uh, we will focus uh, and focus on the on, on the Gaussian ensemble. Okay, so just some definition. So here I I mostly di discuss the case for where m was real and symmetric. 
And this ensemble is well known. Maybe you have already heard about it. It is called the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. So Gaussian is quite clear. Ensemble is also clear. Orthogonal, you see, it does not mean that the, the matrices themselves are, 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 are orthogonal, but the measure is invariant under orthogonal transformations. Okay, so orthogonal is really in that sense. Now I discussed here, as I said, the the real symmetric case. Uh, now, if I was, I mean, the the other ensembles with which which is interesting and which we will uh, discuss. Uh, in, in the following is the case where instead of having real, uh, you can have complex, complex elements, but then M needs to be Hermitian. And in this case, uh, this is what we call the Gaussian unitary ensemble. So again, unitary in the same sense, uh, it's not that we are considering unitary matrices, but the measure is invariant under unitary transformation. Okay, so that means that when you have a complex, when you have a complex um, Hermitian matrix, uh, then what I wrote here, I mean, needs to be slightly modified instead of having here. Uh, so you can still write, you can still diagonalize M under this form, but O, I mean, your matrix O here, which usually we denote by U, uh, is now uh, unitary and not orthogonal. Okay, so that's in that sense that we are talk, talking about uh, that we are talking about um, Gaussian unitary ensemble. Okay, and so usually, uh, and that's the acronym that uh, we will use later on because uh, we'll. Uh, so this is the GOE, and this is the GUE. Okay, so this is all very nice. Uh, we have these ensembles, uh, and uh, they are well defined. But you see, it's a lit they are still lit a little bit formal. And the reason is that uh, if you go back to uh, what we wrote there, uh, it's nice to have something like that. So you know, indeed, that your that your uh, matrix can be diagonalized. And I told you that for such invariant ensembles. Uh, such that the, the Gaussian orthogonal or Gaussian unitary ensembles, uh, the probability measure actually depends only on the eigenvalues. But it's clear that uh, what you would really, what what you would really like to have is is the joint distribution of these eigenvalues. Okay, so in other words, uh, if you think about these Gaussian uh, matrices, you have here a relatively nice way. Uh, and concrete way, in fact, to define these matrices. So you can easily simulate them on your computer because you, you take all these numbers as random and then you fill the matrix uh, as they, I mean, uh, at the correct place where they should be, MJK. But then, of course, uh, the, 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 what you would like to know in many cases, uh, what you would like to know is to, is to say something about the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. So what you really want to do now, and that's what we are going to do, I will. I, it will not be exhaustive, but I will give you um, the main ideas. Um, what you really want to, to look at uh, is to look at the joint the joint law uh, of eigenvalues and eventually eigenvectors. But I already told, told you that uh, the eigenvectors in these ensembles are a little bit boring. Uh, but I would like to know something about the eigenvalues uh, for, say, the GOE. OK? So that's what we will do in the following. So I will start again. I will focus here uh, on the GOE. That means that I will look at M, uh, which is equal to M transpose and real. OK? And of course, uh, I want to, so the idea uh, is, is, to, is to go to the diagonal form. Okay, so I know that uh, I can write M under this form, O lambda, O transpose, or O minus one, with again uh, lambda uh, uh, 
and uh, or, or transpose. It's just the identity. So let me come back to uh, to this number of degrees of freedom that we had before, just to understand a little bit uh, what what we want to do. Um, the main idea, if you want, uh, is, is 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 just to perform a change of variables. The idea is that I gave you a P of M, so you have a measure on the M, which is basically defined by the MG case. Okay, and uh, you would like to go. Uh, so instead of formulating in terms of a measure on the MJ case, you would like to have a measure on lambda and O basically. Okay, so uh, maybe uh, one thing that it's quite useful to write here is that well, it's clear that lambda, this lambda here, encodes the eigenvalues and the O there encodes the eigenvectors. I guess you remember your course on standard linear algebra uh, that uh, you just construct uh, the matrix O uh, by just uh, putting inside uh, the, 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 eigen, the, the, the coordinates of, of your eigenvectors, okay? So the idea is, I mean, conceptually is relatively simple, I think, is that uh, you would like to, instead of having a measure in the probability measure of MJ case, you really want to go to this, to this uh, lambda and O uh, uh, things. Okay, so it just if, if just just to count uh, how how it, I, mean, I just want to to uh, it's just a remark. But uh, we have uh, counted already the number of uh, sorry of uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, we have already seen that uh, they were equal to uh, n n plus one by two. So basically, this sum here, uh, I want to see uh, as the sum of the number of eigenvalues. So this is n, and then the number of degrees of freedom associated to O. And since this is, uh, so here, of course, it's just some algebra, but uh, you can just uh, realize that this is just n and minus one by two. Okay, so this is just a very simple relation, but uh, you can indeed check that if you have an orthogonal matrix of size n, so naively, okay, it's, 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 it's a random matrix, uh, so it's a matrix, it has n square entries, but because of this relation, of course, you have much less and degrees of freedom, and this, this is precisely the number of freedom that you have. So uh, what you really want to do is, uh, through this change of variable, is pass, I mean, or go through, if you want, the P of M, uh, which is quite simple, right? I mean, uh, which is, in this case, uh, which was just something like that. Uh, you would like uh, to go uh, to a probability measure on the lambdas, so that's your eigenvalues and your matrix O. Okay. So in principle, I mean, you see, I mean, we are doing something which is in principle quite quite familiar, and we know that these two um, distribution here uh, they are related uh, through a Jacobian, and This involves a complicated determinant to compute. So more, more precisely, uh, what I want to say is that uh, P of lambda one, lambda n, and O, well, this will be generically given by P of M times the Jacobian. So that means the determinant of uh, some matrix J, and this matrix J uh, is just the matrix of uh, the partial, the partial derivatives. Okay. So I will not write explicitly this uh, this J matrix. Okay. But uh, J 
quote unquote, if you want, because I don't want to write it explicitly, but it is of that form, right? So it just the matrix of partial derivative of d m i j d lambda k and uh, d m i j divided by d o k l. So it's quite complicated matrix. I mean, it's an n square. I mean, it's 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 a matrix of size. Uh, the size of this matrix is quite big. Uh, that's why it's a bit complicated uh, to compute this determinant, but uh, this is just the number of independent degrees of freedom that you have, right? So this is n, n plus one by two cross n, n plus one by two. So, since it's not really a full course on, on random matrices, uh, I don't want to bother you with the computation of this uh, determinant given this matrix, uh, but simply give you uh, the result because it will be extremely useful in the following. Uh, in fact, uh, quite remarkably, uh, it turns out that uh, the determinant of J, so this is for GOE, the determinant of J uh, written this way has actually a very simple structure. And this is just what I'm writing here. So this is uh, this is uh, this beautiful result. Now, so it's remarkably simple, uh, and that's why uh, at the end uh, you see the, the the distribution. So what is quite quite remarkable. It just it, it is indeed simple, but it is also independent on of O. Okay, so the the the, the matrix elements O K L actually do not enter into this this this. Uh... Okay, so if you look at again at this distribution here, uh, that tells you that uh, this the distribution of the lambda i's and O actually are just completely decoupled, because P of M, maybe I should write it. P of M actually depends only on lambda i's, right? Because in this case that we are studying here, P of M is just exponential of A choice M squared. And uh, that's just exponential of A sum over the lambda i squared. So that means that, uh, let me just write it explicitly. I think it would be better. That means that the joint distribution, now we got it, of the lambda i's and the o's, so that means the, the eigenvectors if, essentially, is just one over zn, some constant. Uh, and then I get this product here. Okay, so let me... So you have this nice expression. Just want to displace it a little bit. So let me just write it in this way. I have introduced, maybe I should denote it here. Uh, there is here a power beta. So for GOE, beta is equal to one. Okay, so that's exactly what I showed you here, right? So that comes the one is just this guy. Now, I haven't done the computation for GUE, uh, but it's very similar. And it turns out that uh, for GUE, the expression is exactly given by the same. So that means by this guy. Only beta is different. And beta is equal to 2. So that's quite uh, quite remarkable, of course. Now, uh, I just want to say something about this quantity here. Um, yes, okay. Um, I want to answer this question because it's, it's, it's sufficiently interesting, I think. Um, uh, what would happen? The so question is what would happen if there is degeneracy because then determinant of J is equal to zero? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the, the point is that we are now, we are here dealing with random matrices. 
and the probability and that means that I take these uh, entries uh, as random variables and I draw them from a continuous distribution okay so typically a Gaussian here as we have seen and that means that if you take two random think about uh, so the probability if you want that uh, two uh, eigenvalues exactly coincide uh, is basically equal to zero okay and we will see actually that this is indeed the case in, in a minute but but you, you can already feel it know that uh, if you take uh, two random variables which are Gaussian uh, if you look at uh, if you look at their um, the probability that they are exactly the same I mean this probability uh, is zero so so if you want the this define a set of events which has uh, measure zero okay is that okay i suppose so okay uh, i just maybe want to make one remark uh maybe uh this guy here has a very nice expression and this is called a van der Mond determinant okay and uh, this is just to remind you some basic uh, basic uh, facts uh, from uh, linear algebra, uh, but I just want to discuss what the van der Mond determinant is. So let me define this matrix Vn, which is an n by n matrix, uh, and it is defined from the set of random um, of numbers uh, x x1 x2 xn and they are different from each others and i look at this matrix which has uh, this very nice uh, structure uh, which is like that so i put I, I first consider the variable x1 and i consider 1 x1 x1 squared x1 cube up to x1 to the power n minus one. And then I do the same with x2. And I repeat that up to xn. So it's an n by n matrix, obviously. And if you look at the, if you compute that the, the, the determinant of this, well, okay, I mean, uh, you can just do easily the case n equals two, for instance, just, just to, to, to get fun. Uh, this is just one, x1, x2. So this is v2. Uh, if you compute the determinant of v2, well, it's very simple in this case, this is just x2 minus x1. Now it turns out that if you look at vn here, uh, it's a standard exercise. Uh, in, in linear algebra, I'm sure that many of you have done that. Uh, this is just the product of i less than j, xj minus xi. So that means that what we have here, uh, this term here is just the, the, the absolute value of a uh, van der Mond determinant. Okay. So, it's quite uh, it's quite nice. I mean, because it starts to have. Uh, we would like to understand this 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 measure here, and that's what we are going to do following Dyson in a, in a minute. We would like to understand a little bit better uh, what uh, what is the meaning of this. Is there any nice physical interpretation be, behind this? There is already one thing to notice, and this is related to the question that um, that I answered to uh, to Maynac. You see that. Because of this van der Mond term, which here comes from the Jacobian, uh, you see that uh, the probability that two uh, lambda i's are, equal, are exactly equal, I mean, this probability exactly equals to zero. So that means that really uh, the, these uh, eigenvalues, they somehow repel each other. Okay, so they really don't want to, 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 to stay uh, close to, to each other. And there is some kind of level repulsion, okay? And that's what really this uh, this uh, this is saying. And this is something that you can already easily compute. You can look at n equals two, for instance, and do this this thing. I mean, it's, it's not it's it, it has nothing to do with large and uh, properties. It's really something that 
uh, related to the fact that, that, that I was mentioning a little bit before uh, to, to this question. Uh, that um, the probability that two eigenvalues exactly coincide actually goes to zero. And so there is some, some repulsion, and in some sense, uh, physically, uh, this is somewhat reminiscent of fermions, okay? I mean, roughly speaking, fermions are particles uh, which don't want to occupy the same, um, the same eigenstates. Um, and in some way, it's good to think about, it's good to think of these eigenvalues as the position of, of fermions, and later on in the course, I mean, uh, this will be even more, even more uh, uh, precise. But before uh, discussing, uh, before discussing um, uh, fermions, um, I, will, I want to discuss uh, the connection to, I mean, uh, to, to the Dyson's log gas, the Coulomb gas approach. And here I just want to make, uh, I just want to, I have to, I have to you see, I have not yet settled this uh, this constant a here. So there are various uh, choices. I mean, uh, the, if you look at uh, in the literature, I mean, people usually, I mean, have different ways to um, to 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 choose them. Uh, of course, it's just a matter of scale. So you can just, uh, I mean, pass from one value of a to another value of a by your rescaling of a. Okay, but uh, at some point you need to make a choice. Uh, and uh, for this course, uh, I will, I mean, at least on RMT, uh, I choose the following. So basically, I choose uh, A uh, to be uh, beta n over 2. So that means that I will just now. So I, since this uh, O actually doesn't enter on the right hand side here, uh, I can now integrate. So if I want to look to compute the marginals of the over the lambda i's, uh, then I just need to um, integrate over this uh, the the orthogonal group. So that gives me uh, a number which corresponds to the total integral, but it does not couple uh, the matrix elements of O and lambda i's. So this is already, if you want, up to a prefactor. This is just the joint distribution of the eigenvalues only, and that's. The quantity that I uh, will look at, I mean, that I will uh, focus on uh, in the following. So I will just look at p of lambda one, lambda n. So that means that I have just. Uh, so there is some normalization. Let me call it b n at the moment, and I will define it this way. Uh, I will define it as exponential of minus beta n by two. The sum. And the beta is, is, is a bit arbitrary, but you will see why in a minute what I, I decided to put that. And then I have this lambda j power beta. So as we will see, uh, I chose, so, so the important thing to notice here is this, it is factor n, okay? Uh, this one is not, uh, is not innocent. I mean, and uh, I, I chose it in purpose. The purpose is that uh, as you will see, uh, when we want to take the large end limit, uh, we will see that uh, with this scaling here, it turns out the typical value of the lambda i's are of order one. Okay, I will be a bit more concrete uh, uh, in a minute, uh, maybe only to tomorrow, but at least that's that's the, the idea of this choice. So that means that um, essentially, if I go back to the, uh, okay, I haven't said it here, but uh, if you go back to this, uh, yeah, basically to this. Um, so if I want to write this distribution uh, in this way, so if I want to come back, if you want to the matrix elements, uh, that means that the variance of the, uh, of the diagonal terms are of order one over N, in fact, they are exactly one over n with this choice for beta equals one, and they are basically one over two n uh, of this guy. But what is important to have in mind is that the variance is of order one over n. This might appear a little bit artificial at this stage, but um, again, this is just a matter of rescaling, and uh, you will see why in a minute, I hope. Um, Gregory, I mean, one uh, small question. So, I mean, if you look at the joint distribution of the lambdas and O's, I guess if you integrated out the lambdas, you, one would kind of get a uh, uh, like constant, uh, yeah. which gives the distribution of the eigenvectors, right? Yes, exactly. So that yeah, 
That's a good point. So indeed, so that's a constant in the sense that it does not depend on O's. And that means that um, the, the matrix O itself, the matrix O itself, uh, which encodes uh, the eigenvectors, is uniformly distributed over the orthogonal group. So okay. that means that uh, that means that uh, you, you 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 any I mean they are all equi equiprobable if you want. Okay, so it's this is kind of a uh, it's not obvious like it should have been like is there some simple way to understand this or it's it's uh, it just happens. It has really I mean it it's done somehow by construct I mean. Uh, it's hidden more or less there. Yeah. It's hidden in the fact that uh, somehow the the, the 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 probability measure, uh, you see that if you impose that, somehow it means that the p of m can can only depend on the eigenvalues of m. Okay. Okay. And if it does, if if it if it if if it only depends on the on the eigenvalues of m, that means that all the eigenvectors are equi equally distributed. Okay uniformly distributed right. okay thanks okay so in in, in a sense uh, in this uh, in these ensembles um, uh, the, the the eigenvectors i mean play a very minor role okay. at least if you do not specify it i mean okay of course you can condition say for instance uh, how does the the eigenvalues uh, how does the eigenvectors corresponding to the eigenvalues uh, uh, looks like or these kind of questions but but even this kind of question, in fact, I mean, are a little bit less interesting than uh, for other ensembles. Okay. Uh, if I could add uh, add to it, like, I think this is a consequence of the rotational invariance of the ensemble, because uh, yeah. when you can rotate it arbitrarily, then eigenvectors change, but yeah, eigenvectors yeah, sure. don't change. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's, yeah, that's, that's so, what I was saying. I mean, that it's, it's hidden in by, I mean, in the way the things are constructed, but, but I agree. I mean that this is not completely, completely obvious. And in fact, the computation is not obvious at all. <laughs> I mean, uh, when you really do the computation of this determinant of the Jacobian, right? Uh, well, it's not clear that, uh, but okay, this is true. Okay. Um, so if I have like, so I have what, 10 minutes more or less or? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So now I want to, to understand this uh, in a more physical way. So up to, up to now, one, one could say this is pure math, right? I mean, uh, I didn't, there is no physics there. Um, and what I want to discuss now is uh, the Coulomb, uh, the Coulomb gas approach. This is due to Dyson. And okay, just maybe just to come back. Uh, so you are here, right? Uh, we just end up this and we are moving to this uh, number three here. Okay, so that's a capital three, by the way. Okay, so the idea uh, might look a little bit, I mean, quite simple at the beginning is just to rewrite this term. So to rewrite this term in a more physical way. Uh, physical means that uh, I want to have in mind that, uh, okay, statistical physics. I want to have in mind statistical physics. And um, what I would like to, uh, to see uh, is that um, it turns out that uh, one can write, that will be just some rewriting at the moment. We know that if we want to interpret this uh, as a Boltzmann weight, so that should be exponential of minus beta something, uh, well, this has to be re-exponentiated. So that means that uh, I will start by rewriting this guy as exponential of, say, beta. less than j uh, 
So there's nothing really here, right? I mean, I just uh, rewrote the simple things and maybe it's convenient to, to make it symmetric. So I prefer to write it in this way. But now you see that what is nice uh, is that if you combine uh, this, uh, so if you combine this identity, inject it here, uh, then you start uh, to observe a nice structure, right? Because that tells you that basically your probability weight on the lambdas, okay, so you had your BN, so keep your BN. But then I claim that I can still write it in this way. And E is just the sum of two contributions. One that comes for this one. So I take, I, I took out the beta outside. So this is just, and the minus sign also. So this is n by two times the sum lambda i squared. Okay. And now this term here, the interacting term, the interaction term, uh, is just minus half Okay, so that's your uh, interaction interaction energy. But what is quite nice now uh, is that if you look at these these equations, uh, then you really want to see the lambda i's as the positions of some uh, particles of say charged particles, uh, which are confined in an harmonic potential, and which are uh, in, which are sort of uh, interacting via this uh, this lock term. Okay, so I saw the question. I will answer to them uh, at the end if you don't mind. I just want to finish the the, the explanation here. So again, uh, this is uh, I. This gives, this provides a very nice interpretations in the sense that the lambda i's, I just want to see the lambda i's as the positions, just, just write it explicitly. Charged particles interacting via the log, the log potential so this is actually the Coulomb interaction, but in 2D. So I should better say uh, the 2D Coulomb interaction. And confined on a line. Uh, within a quadratic well, or put a harmonic well, if you want. Okay, so it's really that uh, at the end, uh, I really want to to understand this model as so. I have this. Uh, if I look at the lambda i's, so I would have. Oops. Okay, so we have a quadratic potential and uh, I have my particles which are living on the line. And they, the, 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 the important point again is that they actually are interacting via the uh, the Coulomb interaction here in 2D, okay? So 
again, this is not uh, the, the, the 1D uh, Coulomb gas, which would be uh, linear, mod Xi of minus Xj. Uh, and that's what we usually, so this is a Coulomb gas uh, uh, where the particles live on the line and interact via the 2D Coulomb interaction. And that's what is called the log gas. OK. And this was introduced again by Dyson. Uh, and what is quite nice, again, is that uh, we have we moved now from a purely mathematical problem, where you had eigenvalues, and we translated it into a statistical mechanics problem, uh, which is uh, these uh, particles uh, in a uh, quadratic potential, OK, which is basically lambda squared. So you immediately see uh, and something that I should add is that uh, the interaction, of course, is repulsive. And this is important because we have already seen that these eigenvalues are actually experiencing some level repulsion. And uh, that means that uh, we have here an interaction which is repulsive. So basically, uh, a good way of thinking about this problem now, if I look at, this, uh, at, this, at these particles, is that there is a competition between the potential well, which would like to push all the particles down to the center. And so that's what, if there was no interaction, the ground state would be basically uh, constituted of all the particles at the center collapsed. But because of this uh, repulsive interaction, of course, uh, they cannot do that, okay? Uh, and that's what makes this, uh, this problem interesting, is that um, there is uh, a nice uh, competition between uh, confinement and the repulsive interactions. Okay, and this gives rise actually to a, a very nice, uh, interesting, uh, interesting physics, collective effects that uh, we will uh, describe in more detail uh, uh, next time, I guess. So um, I just, yeah, so that's basically where uh, I will stop today. I think it's a good place to, to, uh, uh, to stop. Um, maybe before I can just try to take the questions that I see in the, in the chat. So Raoul, uh, why choose the coefficient in the exponential to, as opposed to alpha n by two, where alpha is arbitrary? Ah, okay, so maybe maybe now you understood is that uh, uh, this beta, uh, which was a bit, uh, if you remember, I introduced it uh, in a quite arf artificial way here, but I want to see this beta eventually as a temperature. So this means that I want to have basically uh, this A here, I would like to have a beta there, such that I really can write this as a Boltzmann weight. Otherwise, uh, I would have a beta in, in terms, also in the energy, which is, I mean, which could be possible, of course, but uh, uh, which is not uh, the most natural way. So I, I hope this answers your question, Raoul. Mm. GOE are rotationally invariant and their member matrices are real symmetric. Can you elaborate it more clearly? GOE are rotationally invariant. Yes. So that's what I tried to show with these computations. Okay. So basically, I showed you that there are two kinds of ensembles. First ensembles are uh, the Wigner ensembles. Okay. In Wigner, you really think in terms of the elements of your matrices. It's more like you are in front of your computer and you want to simulate a random matrix. And somehow the most natural way to do is probably as Wigner did, uh, is to choose the, the elements of your matrices uh, as uh, independent random variables. Not necessarily uh, identical, but at least uh, there can be, um, uh, so basically uh, the members are, are, are real symmetric and you just have, uh, um, yeah, random elements. On the other hand, um, I 
define these other sets of rotationally invariant ensembles, which are really constructed more from the point of view of symmetry. And there you really want to have, uh, you define your probability measure, not on the, uh, on the entries of your matrix, but on the matrix themselves, okay, which is really different if you think a little bit, uh, which is really different. And that uh, gives rise to this kind of, of, uh, of probability measures, which are rotationally invariant in the sense that uh, you have this, this symmetry, okay? So uh, P of M and P of O, M, O minus one, because of the trace here, obviously have the same probability weight. Now, you can ask, uh, is it possible, I mean, what is the intersection, if any, uh, between these two sets, between these two sets of random matrices? And the answer is that uh, the only intersection uh, is, I mean, consists of these Gaussian matrices, which are the one that I show now, right now, which are of that form. So it's clear that they are rotationally invariant, okay? Because the trace of M squared, if I start to do some uh, similarity transformation uh, that will not change, okay? Because the trace is, uh, is invariant under such transformation. Now, what is less clear is that these matrices, which are which defines a rotationally invariant ensemble, are also uh, real symmetric, and they are of the type of uh, the Wigner one. And that's what I showed in this computation: is that if you really write what the weight is uh, at the end of the day what you see is that this is equivalent to defining uh, the probability measures of M in terms of uh, the matrix elements and the distributions of the matrix elements are just written here. Okay, notice there is a small misprint here. Did I answer your question, Ram Gopal? Okay, great. Uh, so Rav, uh, since there is no kinetic term, how do we define the dynamics, equations of motion of these charged particles? Yeah, okay. Uh, if you want, uh, if you want, uh, you can just, uh, so the, 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 that means that you have a Hamiltonian if you want, uh, which is just the, the kinetic energy uh, plus uh, the, the, the interaction part and potential energy if you want. Potential energy includes the interaction between the particles and the confining uh, energy. But since uh, there is no coupling, if you want, between the the um, the, impulse, the the momenta uh, pi squared uh, and this xi's, I mean, eventually uh, this is just uh, factorization in the um, partition function. So I can just discard this term. Okay, they are just spectators, if you want. They do not. If if you want to define a dynamics, of course, uh, of course, you, you need to include this kinetic term. But here I'm just looking at the equilibrium, uh, equilibrium and thermodynamical behavior. Okay, Harry, if a further restriction of positive semi-definiteness is imposed, is anything universal known about the characteristics of eigenvalue distribution? Uh, the answer, uh, okay. Um, I don't know very well these ensembles, but uh, I do believe that uh, they actually define another set. I mean, yeah, I'm pretty sure in fact, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, this, this, this indeed defines a constrained ensembles, uh, which you can still study by various, uh, various means, uh, but uh, you will end up uh, on uh, different kinds of ensembles. I don't know about the universality properties uh, of these ensembles. I would naively guess that uh, they are as universal as the Gaussian ensembles are, which I will discuss a bit later. That means that my guess is that um, if there is a kind of central limit theorem in this in this random matrix ensembles, uh, which is that uh, if the matrices, if the, the sorry for the Wigner for the Wigner uh, for Wigner case, okay, if I look at the Wigner matrices, uh, if they have a a second moment, uh, which is well defined, then in the large n limit, uh, basically the Wigner matrices will converge to something which looks very much like uh, a Gaussian orthogonal or Gaussian unitary ensemble in the large n limit, and it will be exactly similar in the limit when n goes to infinity. I guess that this is the same if you start to impose some restriction as you have in mind, Harry, uh, but uh, I must say that I don't have any concrete reference for that. But I can, yeah, probably it's uh, I'm, I guess that people have studied that though. 
Uh, yeah, in, in certain applications, like you sort of encounter uh, uh, this restriction. So I was thinking like if there is universal known about it. I see. Yeah, I, 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 I guess it should, uh, th th there should be some universal behavior, pretty sure. Uh, I think uh, uh, we shared in samples have this property of positive semi definite. Uh, but well, we shot is we shot is yet a bit different, but uh, yeah, yeah, like it's defined like x times x uh, yes. dagger, so yeah. It's, yeah. it's positive semi-definite. So. Yeah, well, if if you if you well, it depends. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, that's one way of seeing it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. But these are not, I think, the only ones that are positive semi-definite. We shot is of is of that type, but this is not this is not the full story about positive semi-definite. I think, I mean, not that I think. I'm sure. Uh, some kind of positive definite matrix, right? Uh, Sorry? I think uh, Wishard ensembles are like uh, you sort of define some auxiliary random variables and like uh, from them yes. you construct uh, quadratic forms and they sort of behave. Sure, sure. No, what I'm saying is that Wishart matrices are, of course, positive semi definite, but not all positive definite matrices are of Wishart type. That, that was my okay, point. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other question? Yeah, I think there's another question. Uh, yeah, okay, it's true. I mean, okay, I haven't, uh, if you can order them actually, it's the, the ordering is not, okay. Uh, there is this question, maybe it's interesting already to, to answer it. Raoul says, uh, I guess the form of P lambda uh, are not ordered. So that's what the lambda i's are not ordered. What is the form if they are ordered? Um, well, it is basically that you have uh, uh, just one over factorial n, I mean, in between, but uh, because the, so that's important to notice that the, the joint distribution, uh, which you can read it here or even say here, uh, it's completely invariant under permutations of the lambda i's, okay? So all the, the sectors that you can order in, in a prescribed way, so this is called these vile chambers, if you want, uh, they are just all equivalent. So uh, if I start to um, write or impose that uh, this, the lambda i's are ordered, then I will have to multiply this by uh, some n factorial here. So, but 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 it will not change the shape of the uh, of the uh, of um, yeah of a, of this uh, of the joint distribution. So the question is: Is it similar to have a similar level repulsion in non-random matrices? Well, in fact, uh, it's not really. It's not a property of. Uh, that's a good point. I mean. Um, this is a property of linear algebra. I mean, this level repulsion. I mean, in quantum mechanics, in, in fact, is, this is also known. I mean, but uh, uh, indeed, I mean, this is generically, uh, if you look at a random matrix, uh, I mean, if you look at a matrix, sorry, <laughs> uh, typically uh, it will really feel uh, level repulsion. Okay, so the, 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 it's, it's, it's very unlikely that uh, you will have a coinciding, uh, uh, coinciding, uh, Eigenvalues, yeah, it's a bit, yeah, it's it's a bit difficult to make a more precise uh, answer to 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 the question. Uh, if so, what properties must the matrix have? Uh, yeah, okay. Again, uh, if the question is more the other way around, I mean, if you want to have a matrix which like uh, to have a, a coinciding eigenvalues, then you really need to to design it in a special way. Uh, hi, sir. Uh... I wanted to know uh, whether uh, there are other kinds of interaction potential which are possible in random, matri random matrices. Here it's log. So is there any other example where uh, it's not log gas, something else, which is coming from random matrices? Sure, yeah. So uh, in fact, uh, in random matrices, uh, you will always have a log. I mean, uh, and uh, you will never get uh, this uh, interacting potential that you like, Jitendra. Um, in fact, the, the deep reason is, is always the same, uh, is that the, the interactions that you get from the, uh, from between the eigenvalues in all the matrix ensembles, uh, in fact, even, even though, I mean, even the, the ones that are, uh, yeah, even if you go, for instance, to a higher dimension. So here I, I have been discussing real, uh, real spectra, but if you look at more general matrices, uh, where you would have uh, complex eigenvalues like Ginebra ensembles or so on. Um, the interactions always, always uh, come from uh, this kind of 
uh, of a uh, of manipulation. So it really comes from this van der Monde uh, because it's it has this is deep root in uh, in linear algebra. Okay. Um, so that's uh, that's that one thing. So you can have some variant of it. For instance, instead of having log of lambda i uh, plus minus lambda j, you could have on top of that uh, log of lambda i plus lambda j. But this is just a kind of mirror symmetry. For instance, this is what you can get in some uh, uh, in some uh, okay in some models uh, in some fermion models which are related to random matrices. So so this might appear, but generically uh, you will get something some variance around that. So does the, uh, is that something like level attraction lambda i plus lambda j? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. it's uh, the, as far as I know, at least. Uh, okay, I'm not saying that maybe you can come up with a very, uh, very, I mean, exotic result, exotic matrix models. But all the the matrix models that 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 people have, I mean, that I know I should say, uh, they are all of that form. Thank you. Okay, I have a distinct. Suppose you want to physically construct this Coulomb gas in one di dimension, uh, the 2D Coulomb gas. So, do I need infinite potential in the other direction to close it? Because I guess any other potential, if you put it, will give you a spread, right? Yes, absolutely. So, yeah. So, I guess so indeed. So, that means that so that's typically what happens when you look at this more general model uh, that I just. Uh, mentioned here. Uh, which is, uh, sorry, yes, uh, right, this one, uh, this V of M. Okay, so uh, if you look at this kind of, of, of model here, uh, this one, sorry. Uh, so if you look at the joint distribution of the eigenvalues, then you will have typically the, the van der Monde so it would look like something like that. If you really look at it, this case, if you look at the uh, the P of lambda i's, so you will have, as usual, the van der Monde term, beta equals one or two, uh, whatever, and then generically you will have this term. And indeed, uh, depending, uh, can, can you read it? Yes, I can read it. Yes. So depending on V, uh, so essentially, uh, if V is sufficiently confining, basically if, if it grows faster than logarithmic, then it will confine the particles on a finite support. And many things then become sort of universal, especially if you look at the edge, or at least if you look at the, uh, local correlations, uh, they tend to be pretty universal. But if, uh, so this is true as long as V uh, grows faster than logarithmic. So any any potential that you might think of uh, could do the job, but uh, it, there, there are ensembles, uh, for instance, what is called the, uh, the Cauchy ensembles, uh, where you have logarithmic growth, which is a kind of borderline, and then you cease to have uh, you cease to have a, a finite support, and then you have a, uh, the, the the eigenvalues are then spread up over the, the the real line. But in fact, for a large class of potentials, indeed, uh, all the phenomenology that you get from the Gaussian case are, are there. And that's also why I mean maybe uh, that's uh, um, that's also why these Gaussian ensembles actually are, are very interesting. Is that uh, it's not only that we can compute things with them, but in fact, there is a quite uh, important dose of uh, universality. And, uh, and many things that you will learn from the Gaussian ensembles remain true, at least in the large end limit. And in, there are some differences. And I think I will, I will try to discuss this. Uh, I wanted to discuss this a little bit more uh, next, uh, next, next, in the next, in the next lecture. 
I think there's yeah no more questions. So maybe we'll just stop here today and okay. we'll again see you tomorrow. Thanks. Okay, great. Yeah. So okay. Bye bye. Okay, guys. guys. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. By the way, Sanjib, I mean was it uh, was it okay? I mean the, the yes, 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 yes. Yeah. okay. You can read it yeah. and hear it, is is fine. Yeah, yeah, it's clear, very clear. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. So you can see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Great. Bye. Bye. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Ciao. Ciao.